Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're talking with really one of my favorite artists in long rifle and, and contemporary culture. Uh, it's somebody who I've, I've looked up to as an artist uh, for many years, seeing his work at shows. We're talking to Ken Scott today about his journey as an artist in muzzleloading and long rifle culture, how he got into it and how his art has changed with time, both in, in terms of the time periods that he's representing and in terms uh, of himself as an artist, as he's looking at original documentation and expanding on it in a contemporary way. Uh, I think if you're interested in Ken's work or if you're interested in contemporary muzzleloading culture and, and what it is and where it's going, I think you'll enjoy this conversation. I want to thank you for, for, asking me to sit down and have a conversation with you about what I do. Well, I appreciate you, you know, taking the time out of your day. I I know a lot of people are, are big fans of your bag, and, and I appreciate you talking with me about it. No problem. You know, I think people will, will learn a lot about, I mean, not just your work. I, I try to talk to people about their work, but also, you know, how they arrive to where they are today and, and kind of where they're going, because uh, a lot of the people that I talk to and that listen to the show are kind of new into this or, or not necessarily didn't grow up in it like I did or, or haven't been in it for several years like you have. And, and they don't really know what's out there. And by sharing stories of, of you and, and people like you, kind of your journey through this, I think people can relate to it a little bit more and, and feel uh, a little more involved you know, they they know that they can kind of grow with it over time rather than being perfect right out the gate. Yes, yes, that's that's very important that uh, people realize there's going to be a learning curve in this, and, and, and doing as much research as they can about things and talking to people. And there's just really some some neat artisans out there and some neat people in muzzleloading. Yeah, and uh, you know if you just are willing to, to approach people and talk to them, you can learn a tremendous amount. Yes. Yes, you can. There's so many people that are so willing to share. Um, I think now more than ever, I don't know what's changed, but you can just learn anything right now. It's just great. Yeah, you sure can. Well, you know, a lot of people, myself included, held on to our secrets for years. You know, I held on to my stuff for years because it really took me about 10 years to figure out the process that I needed to do in order to make my work look like it's, it does. Right. And then, then after a time, I thought, well, why not share this with people? You know, uh -huh. it, it's, it's going to, when I'm gone, it's going to be gone. And if I can, can help get that out and get some new people interested it would really, really help the uh, the whole muzzle loading, uh, the whole muzzle loading thing, you know. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I feel like there's a, just like as you're getting, you know, like for somebody like me, I, I'm I'm still fairly young, and like there's this growth curve for me of of starting to do more research and and looking at more primary documentation, but I think then too for somebody like you, you're at a point in in your curve as an artist and, and as a maker that you're kind of transitioning into, into sharing that. What, what do you think causes that? Or do you, or is it just something that happens with time? Do you think? Well, I do think it happens with time because, you know, when you start out, uh, you know, or when I started out, you talk to these older guys and they didn't want to share much and you had to learn it on your own mm -hmm. and just all kinds of things. But, the, the the sharing it came to me several years after I'd been doing stuff and figured out some of my processes and I thought this really would be nice if other people knew how to do this mm -hmm. and so you know that's that's what I've tried to do is to you know I teach teach the workshops and the different things about several factors that I do whether it's it's a German design or Southern design or, mm -hmm. or honey pouches or Proctor or whatever. I just want to pass that on. Mm. And uh, you know what? I'm trying to, to pass that on and teach people. One of the things I really want them to do is take the information that I put out and then build their own style and their own creativity to it. Yeah, there's one thing to, I think, to look at 
somebody else's work, be it a contemporary maker or an original, you know, that's in a museum or in a private collection and, and, and try to recreate that. But I think it's important, especially to the contemporary community, that we try to build on that that reference material. I know myself, I, I try to do that and, and play with that some because I can I can look at a at a book or something and, and kind of sketch something out and, and get it pretty close to that original. But it's more fun for me to use what I learned on kind of deconstructing that original from the pictures to then go and play with something at, that appeals to me more. You know, it's maybe a little bit more of an original idea. Right. And then it becomes your own. Yeah. You know, so that that's that's really a good thing is saying, you know, I took the information that I found and build on it and I created something on my own mm -hmm. and it's not just a copy. You know, yeah. it's got the some of the same basics that that everything has, but it's it's something that you can create yourself. And that's that's a that's a wonderful process and it's a good feeling when you do that. Yes. I think that's a feeling that people don't I, I think if you've not gone through it you might not understand it but it's a truly i think a wonderful feeling to make something that is yours and to to finish a project and hold it in your hands and be like yeah i made this and you can see the influences of of your life and and things that you have gone through and the things that you studied all come out in that single piece it's kind of a, a little time capsule of your experience that led to the creation of that thing i agree with you yes that's exactly right. And time capsule is a good word, you know, because once you open that time capsule, you find all kinds of things in there that, that have gone before. Yeah. History and whatever. But there's things that you think, oh, here's something neat that I can I can do or I can build on. And um, and like I said before, just make it your own. So, Ken, you have a variety of skills across a lot of mediums. How would you describe yourself? That's that's tough, and I get I get asked that a lot. First of all, I basically think, okay, I'm an artist. I'm an artist, and I can do several things that I'm comfortable with, but there are a tremendous amount of things that I can't do. So, I just basically describe myself as an artisan who likes to create stuff. That has a history, has a story to tell, has uh, a patina about it that looks like it's been loved and handed down from generation to generation from someone. And um, th when I do that, I feel really good about that. Hmm. It's a good feeling to create something that looks like it might be a couple of hundred years old and um, to put your touch on it. So I, I would have to say, basically, you know, I'm just... I'm just an artist and who likes to work in, in various mediums and um, who likes to create something that looks old and looks loved. Your life is taking you across a lot of career paths. Have you always been an artist or is your more contemporary creative work, did that come later in life for you? Well, I've always been an artist when I, when I was very young. I would sketch and draw, and I finally got into art school after I graduated from high school. And that gave me the basics to build on. But coming out of, of uh, art school and trying to find an art job was difficult, so I had to go into several different things. I was in radio broadcasting for a number of years, um, worked in, in uh, broadcast news, you know, gathering news, writing news, producing the new shows. Um, I've worked with advertising agencies as creative director, and as an artist and illustrator. Um, I worked in retail. Um, I was the advertising manager for a major department store chain. And, um, you know, my wife and I started our business um, I had been with an advertising agency and was their creative director, and we decided to start our own business and see what we could do. Hmm. And we did that a number of years ago, um, back in I don't know, the late 70s, I think it was. And uh, we've enjoyed that. We, we've worked together every day, 24-7 since, since the late 70s. Wow, that's wonderful. How does that go? You know, we've talked to some, <laughs> some other, you know, kind of, 
uh, power couples, as I would call it. Um, you know, is it is it still the same after all those years working with your wife every day? That's wonderful. It really is. It's it's wonderful. When we first started that, people would say, "You work with your wife? How can you do that?" <laughs> and I say. Well, if you can't get along with her during the day, how do you get along with her in the evening when you go home if you haven't worked with her, you know? Mm -hmm. So we just, we build, a, a, we, we have a great relationship and we built uh, in the advertising agency marketing firm that we had, we shared responsibilities, but she had her responsibilities as she did. I had my responsibilities that I did. If there was any question or you had any doubt, we would go to each other and discuss that to get the other person's opinion. But the final decision was, was the one whose area of expertise fit that that particular department. Mm, okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, you know, worked with her. It was great. She was president of the company. And, uh, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so she, in fact, my boss. But. It was great to, to work with her and talk about things and share things. And it wasn't like going to work and coming home and your wife would say, well, what did you do today? <laughs> we already knew what each other did. And, uh, you know, it was, it was good. It was very fulfilling. It really was. Yeah. So how did that lead then into uh, your focus on now kind of colonial American you know, 18th century, 17th, 18th century artwork. And, and why did you kind of hone in on this area and this time period? That colonial artwork aspect has been there for a long time. It's been there since the early 70s. When we were re re leading up to the bicentennial okay. of the country. And a fr I, I used to shoot archery and really enjoyed it. And a friend and I got together and I said, I'd like to build a flintlock. And so he and I got together and built this flintlock. And then I found out there was a muzzle-loading club in the area. So I went to that. And out of about 40 people, I was the only guy shooting flint. Everybody else was shooting percussion. Hmm. And a lot of guys saw what kind of fun I was having shooting my flint and how good it was. And they decided to switch over from percussion to flint. And so um, the colonial art aspect developed out of that because, you, first of all, you you need to, with my leather hunting pouches, you need to have a bag to carry all the stuff in that you're going to service yeah. and fire that firearm. And so I would go to Friendship and buy leather and make, make leather pouches, take it back to Friendship the next season, and trade them for more leather so that I could further, further my craft. I was a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> we had blanket shoots, you know, a $5 blanket shoot or a $10 blanket shoot. Somebody put something on the blanket, and I would put a pouch on the blanket, and it was usually one of the first things to go. Yeah. And so it helped. that helped me uh, develop my craft and to, to really get further interested in this. And then you got to know knife makers and like Smith and things like that. Um, the art aspect, um, I really like old illustrations, and I love Pennsylvania German Frochter and Pennsylvania German folk art. You know, the Pennsylvania Germans and the Dutch did some wonderful, wonderful things mm -hmm. to, to brighten up their life. Yeah. You know, whether they painted a trunk or a butter bowl or whatever, you know, it was just wonderful. And I started studying that and decided to, to do a bunch of fractures. And so I did, and the more I got into that, I realized that a lot of those uh, records of marriage and birth and different things like that were done in, inside Bibles or inside books, or they were, were done to be placed in chests and things. Okay. And so I, I looked at the book aspect, and I thought, that's really neat. I liked that. And... Hmm. I started to, to do my work on the inside of book covers. And then I thought, well, you know, kids, and I would see old books that kids had written in on the inside covers, arithmetic assignments and drawings and things. Yeah. So I started to add that to my work. And I really thought that that gave it a more, a, a, a deeper, um, more depth and more perception of reality than just doing something that not, 
not giving it that extra life or extra dimension. You know, if you take an old book cover, if you look at that, first of all, the book has a history itself. Mm -hmm. That book has traveled around. People have read that book. That book has been through a lot of things that we don't have any idea what it's been through. But it starts to develop a feel and patina after it's been been around for 80 or 100 years. And that just added to what I wanted to achieve. And so, you know, I do historical narrative paintings, you know, washing mm -hmm. across the Delaware. I do uh, Boston Tea Party, Lewis and Clark, different things like that. Um, and if, if, if I look at a historical event and want to do a narrative of that, I can, I've done that several times, but I also will create historical events. Um, for instance, I did a painting of um, Jacob and Anna Barnes, and it was an attack on their cabin. Uh, the cabin burned. The whole family was killed. And um, so I said, okay, this was done on February 14th. This is the origin original St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Oh. And so I, I had the picture of the uh, of Jacob standing in the, in the moonlight, firing back at the, the perpetrators, the cabin on fire. But then the biggest portion of the, the, the painting was uh, Hannah in a coffin, with a baby, some smaller coffins around her, and then Jacob's coffin by, beside of her. And then the Mid M Memento Mori uh, tombstone beside that with some inscriptions on it about, uh, about their life and different things like that. So I create events, and I really enjoy that, too. Mm -hmm. you know? And then I got into, I did a... A residency at a historical site here in Indiana. I um, was down there for two weeks Ooh, in a log wow. cabin. Yeah, in a log cabin, uh, compost toilet, no running water, <laughs> and there was a lot of bugs and insects around. And I started drawing the bugs and the insects, and I thought, you know, I really enjoy this. And then I started drawing birds, uh, doing the birds and the butterflies and things. And that's how I developed getting into the the naturalist art of uh, of uh, early colonial naturalist. I did a study of those guys, and uh, so you know it just it just develops. It's it's just a never ending process if you start and if you're open to to research and to to, to just what's available to you. You know you can you can take your craft a long way. Yeah. I, I feel like kind of how we started the conversation, you know, there's kind of that, that curve or path. And as you continue along that path, there's going to be those little offshoots and those little side trails that you can step out on and, and go down a totally different route and then find your way back to that main path, kind of like you have on, on connecting these different forms of artwork, you know, between the bags and the accoutrements and the paintings and illustrations and, and making them, I mean, they all, they all make kind of, uh, your artistic journey. Uh, and it, it's neat to hear you talk about that because it, it feels as natural as the, the art that you're creating, you know, you're working with natural materials, you, uh, you know, there's nothing really man-made necessarily about it because there wasn't in the 17th, mm -hmm. uh, in the 18th centuries or the, or the 18th and 19th, I should say. You're correct. Uh, uh, yeah, it was interesting. My wife and I were out foraging through the woods out in a uh, surrounding county out here. And um, I saw, saw an old brick and I picked up part of a broken brick. And I said, said to my wife, and this was just the day before yesterday, hmm. I'm going to take this brick. And I'm going to see if I could make a pigment out of it to do some painting with, you know, because it's it's got this reddish color and, uh, you know, it's a natural earth pigment. And so I just want to give that a try and see how that works out. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It is a learning process. And if you see things and you're open to them, you can take that journey a lot further. This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. 
The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Muzzleloader Magazine, the publication for traditional black powder shooters. Since 1974, Muzzleloader has been the leading magazine devoted to traditional black powder hunting and shooting. Each issue is jam-packed with articles on hunting, shooting, gunsmithing, do-it-yourself projects, living history, American history, book and product reviews, and much, much more. Muzzleloader Magazine is the best traditional muzzleloading magazine, bar none. I'd like to thank Jason at Muzzleloader Magazine for his continued support of I Love Muzzleloading and the I Love Muzzleloading podcast. I don't care what you're into. If you're interested in muzzleloading, this is the kind of magazine I think you need to check out. I've been a fan of Muzzleloader Magazine even before the sponsorship. Uh, I've always been impressed with what Jason has been able to put out with Muzzleloader Magazine, and it really means a lot for him uh, to be supporting I Love Muzzleloading and our efforts over here. Thank you, Muzzleloader Magazine, for your support. What do you think about, we've kind of talked about create, you know, looking at reference and, and creating your own style and your own work out of that reference. Uh, when it comes to the like, historic recreation, have you done any of that for like a museum or anything or, or something like that? Or is that the kind of thing that you're not necessarily interested in because you I can't have, be so creative, I guess? Yeah, I have done some um for a couple of couple of museums, but um, it's it's that's not really what I'm interested in. I want to take mm -hmm. it beyond that because if you look at look at the books, the the the, the stuff is a lot of li a lot of like, and it's it's done basically the same way. So it doesn't give you that that creative spark. Yeah, I I like to talk about the the natural progression of this over time, like muzzle loading culture or long rifle culture, you know, it never really stopped. It, it may have dwindled quite a bit, but I, I really enjoy the connection of, of seeing contemporary work like yours and then looking at a bag from, you know, say the, the fifties or the forties or thirties when you, you kind of had a resurgence of this and then skipping back then to when that was a primary use item. Uh, in the 18th and, and 19th centuries. And, and there's just a neat, you can, you can draw that lineage and you can see how that has changed as an art form over time. And I think what we're doing today, you can, you can draw that line and you can see it continuing into the future. Yes, I agree with that. And if you look at, uh, just take the gun builders out there, mm -hmm. you can see what they've done, you know, over the last 50 years and where, where that started in the, in the early 70s, let's say, and has progressed to today, there's a big difference. Oh, yeah. There's a huge difference. I mean, you look at the, the quality of, of guns being built now, and you if you get the chance to look at some originals, I mean, you're, you're mm -hmm. working in totally different time periods with, with a lot of different materials. We have a lot of advantages now. But you're making some. There are people out there making some incredible things right now. It's just, it's magnificent. I think to see it continue in such a a wonderful way. Yeah, I agree with that. It really is. And then if you look at some of the gun builders and some of the artisans and the the uh, long rifle culture, they've taken that and then they'll put their own touch to it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I'm going to mention a couple of names and. Yeah, I don't. You know, if you look at Ian Pratt and Ken Higgins' work, those guys have got the skills down to make a gun, but they've got the creative knowledge and the wherewithal to make it their own and take it to that next step. Whether they paint on it or whether they 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 carve on it or whatever, you can tell that they've taken that basic uh, idea and made it their own. 
And that's what's exciting about this. And as you know, as I go through places like uh, the CLA events and some of the other events I go to, it, it just excites me to see people that are doing exciting things like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about like what we keep, I guess I keep bringing it up, but there's something about working from that reference material and then making it that next thing. You know, what do you think, you know, for somebody that's a, maybe young, a young person, they, they know your work and maybe they're kind of learning a little bit more about your process. Could you talk a little bit about the how and the why you go from that original reference material to that creative thing? I, I realize that I'm, I'm asking you to define kind of a, a creative process here, but are you are you sketching out in a in a sketchbook or are you working by reading journals or things or, or how do you go about that you know making that kind of new thing and how would you explain that to somebody who who might not be there yet but wants to be well if you're if you're looking at honey pouches first of all there are a few books that are pretty good that's got some 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 original honey pouches in them so that you can look at those and that gives you the basis you know you can you can figure out the size where the original honey pouches were 64 square inches eight by eight or whatever and as time went on they got larger um to today but you look at that and you see what was done and you say okay here's one with a little incised uh drawing on 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 the flat or here's one with, with a little small cutout. Um, here's one that's got a couple of dew claws stuck on the front. And so you look at that, and then you think, oh, if I was going to do that, if I was going to do it, what would I do? And so you come up with this new incised drawing or even a tattoo effect to do some folk art on the front of it. Um, and, and you just build on it, look at it, and use your own creative judgment and say, here's where I want to take this. To make it my own, uh, I don't want it to keep it basic like it was. You know, I want the skills and the handiwork in it, the professional skills, the professional handiwork um, in this this item. But I want people to look at that and say, "Oh, I know who made that." Mm -hmm. You want them to. You want to be able to put kind of your own signature on it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess jumping back to our questions here, uh, listeners have probably seen a few movies that have featured your work. You know, what's what was it like creating a few pieces for Hollywood? And are there any experiences that you can share from that that time? Yeah, well, first of all, it was neat to, to be able to do that. <laughs> um, uh, the first time I got called was for a movie, and they wanted three bags in ten days. Oh and my I gosh! Them, yeah, no, I can't do that. You know, I could have made three bags in ten days if I'd sit out and, and done it. But I said, no, I can't do that. And the quality is going to be there. And they said to me, "What? Well, you know, it's just a movie prop." And I said, "Yeah, but after the movie's over, it's still my work, <laughs> and it's going to end up someplace, and people are going to look at that and say, well, this isn't done the way it should be done here. It's just thrown together here. This is like." Um, it's a mess, <laughs> <laughs> you know, from an artist's standpoint. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to pass on this one. And then after it was over, I thought, oh, well, you know, that, that was probably my chance to get in the movies with some of my stuff. So I decided my wife and I talked and we said, well, if they ever call again, um, we'll clear the board and we'll, we'll see what they're going to do. So, um, Got a call from another uh, studio was doing a movie. Um, they wanted a bag, wanted me to to send it out to them. They were going to review. They had some other people working on bags, and they were going to review them in a meeting and uh, decide what to do. And I thought, okay, you know, it's not unlike the advertising business where you show somebody a campaign and let them decide what they want to do, and they make a call out a couple of other people and then pitch the best idea. Yeah. But time went on, a couple of months went on, and I hadn't heard from them. And I thought, I'll give these guys a call and say, you know, what's happening? Um, and so I called them, and they said, oh, we just had the meeting yesterday. The uh, the main actor tried on all the bags. He likes your business best. That's the one we're going to go with. Wow. Said, Great. Okay. Now, 
we need, I think it was two they wanted. I was thinking the other day where it's two or three, but I think it was at least two that they wanted duplicates in case something happens when they're filming a movie, something happens to that prop. <laughs> they can't start the movie over. They just pull another prop that looks just like it out of the, out of the prop room and go from there. Okay. And so I did that, and then I got a call for another movie, and they said, we would like for you to make a couple of pouches. We know what basically what we want, what we want them to look like, the time period we discuss all of that. And so I said, okay, I'll make up two prototypes and send them out to you. So I sent those out, and they called back and said, okay, we want prototype A. I said, okay, so I can get you get you down to one of those and get it out to you. And they said, the, the, the star is going to wear this. Well, what happened was, as the time went on, the costume people, the costume director decided, no, I want that one. Another person in the movie, another one of the main characters to wear that one. I want the star to wear something else. And so it was still in the movie. But it wasn't the main character. It was like a, a co-star. Okay. And then they also asked for they asked for additional props, you know, some leather-bound journals, some writing instruments, and some things like that that they knew that I, I develop and make. But it's a neat it's a neat thing. And one of the things that's interesting when you say, "Yeah, I'll do it," they FedEx you a check the next day. Really? Yeah. And so you cash the check, you know, you're, you're in the game. Right. So you, better go. Yeah. <laughs> They've got the hook they're, set at that they're, point. Yeah, they're good, yeah, they're good pay. They really are. <laughs> and um, it was it was neat to be able to do that. And it was it was it was kind of an ego booster to say, yeah, I've got some stuff in some movies, and you know, but you know, whatever Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I keep looking. On eBay and things to see if those bags have ever come up for sale, if they've ever pulled them out of the prop room, because I thought, hey, I might buy one of those. Oh, but no, yeah. I, I haven't seen them yet. Huh. Yeah. Maybe someday. We'll have to all keep our eyes peeled for that one. Yeah. So did they ever say how they how they found you? Was it was it the books or the magazines? or? It was, it was actually one of the uh, prop managers, oh, set designer, excuse me, one of the set designers was walking through the CLA one time in the early days, looking for work for uh, uh, some, some of these movies. Really? And, uh, yeah. And so um, I could, because I asked him, um, how did you hear about me? Well, so and so the, uh, the set designer saw your stuff at the CLA show, and he um, he thought that we, could, we could use that. Another time, um Prop designer took some of my work. He bought some of my work, which I mean, looks to me who he was, and he took it into the uh, director and the people, the uh, the prop people, and said, "Here's some of this stuff I think you should use, and we should order this stuff from this guy." Hmm. So that's, that's how it happened. But yeah, it was it was it was, it was neat. It really was. Yeah. So you you've been involved with the CLA for for quite a while, then, haven't you? Yes, I didn't join. I'm not one of the original members, but I joined the first year. Okay, because I hadn't heard about it before hmm. it, before the first meeting. So I went to I think it was the second meeting down in, in Kentucky and uh, across the river in Cincinnati, and thought this is neat. There is some really some some great artisans here, and you know. Every year, and I say this, if people ask me, what do you think about CLA? I say it's a, it's, it's, it's a great event. The organization is super. It's fantastic. It's promoting artisans of the long rifle culture. And every year when I walk into that building, I look around and say, okay, next year, I've got to up my game a little bit. <laughs> and I have to be a little sharper because I see over the year that some people's work has improved and there's really some neat stuff. And you think, oh, yeah, that's cool. And it's just, it's it's um, it's one of those organizations that you look at and think, yeah, I really want to be a part of this, but I want to be a good part. I don't want to be somebody who sits on the sidelines. And I want them to be 
a person whose artwork is has got a good level to it. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, it's it's not like a a competition or intimidating, but no, it's the kind of thing where you go and I always leave with a bunch of ideas, and I'm yeah. always anxious to get home and open up a sketchbook and because I'm I'm there and I'm seeing how other people are deconstructing you know, notions or common practice and then rebuilding them like we're talking about into this new or different thing. And that always sparks something in me. I'm like, oh man, what if you did something? What if you did this over here then? You know, there's like a bunch of doors get opened up when you get a bunch of people like that. that I've spent the last year thinking and, and scheming, you know, on the next, on the next work really to come and show it off. It's just a, it's a really neat experience, I think. It is. And you asked me a while ago if I use a sketchbook. No, I don't use a sketchbook. I keep everything in my head pretty much. So Really? Um, yeah. I will start to cut patterns. Um, and I can cut, you know, I do this on my DVD, and I do it in my workshop. I cut four or five patterns, you know, in, in, in three or four minutes to show people how easy it is to cut patterns, but those patterns are developed in, in my head. And then I go from there and I create the, the flap of the pouch first. Okay. And if the flap hasn't turned out the way I want it. You know, I either toss it away or set it aside and then start over. But I've got that. That's the focal point of that pouch. And then it's got everything else has got to fit to that. And so that has to be, you know, 100 to 120% accurate the way you wanted it when you started. So when you're when you're thinking about making that new pouch, your your process is starting with an idea for that flap. And then you're building yes. the pouch and its details around that flap. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, whether it's going to be a Fowler pouch or a Pennsylvania German game bag or, you know, a southern pouch or whatever, that flap it's going to be the focal point of that. Everything else has got to fit into it geometrically or around it geometrically in, in, in good design. Right. But that flap is, is the thing people are going to look at first. And if it's not right, you know, it's it's just it's not going to be worth you know hanging on the hook. Right. They're just going to go on, you know, almost like the when you're thinking about a composition with a painting or a photograph. You know, you have to have that focal point that catches people or else they're going to move on to the next thing. Absolutely. Hmm. And I, you know, I've thrown away pouches. I've thrown away flaps. You know, people say, what? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I had, and I used to make a pattern for every pouch I was going to make. And I had two, two large filing cabinets full of patterns. Oh my gosh. And, yeah, I did. <laughs> and it's interesting. Uh, about three years ago, we moved. And just before we moved, I took all those patterns and threw them away. Really? And I, yeah, I jokingly said, you know, th- there's some neat stuff here, and I could pass it on. But I tell you, that what's really going to happen to this, if anything happens to me, it's going to be auctioned off in the estate sale. <laughs> somebody's going to bid $3 for all these patterns. I'm just going to toss them away. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gave you the opportunity, too, to kind of start fresh. It did. And, it and, really did. And move past that, huh? Yeah. So as an artist, I, I'm curious, because you were, you've were you been around you know, pre-digital age, and you were creating a lot of artwork pre-digital age. I've, I've mostly grown up in the digital age. Has, has your work and has long rifle culture changed going from the the analog to the digital age for me as an as an artist when i'm looking for something i can just like this morning or today at lunch i was i was sitting in the office and and i was looking up uh, original journals of of surveyors that were coming across the ohio and and surveying into indiana Uh and that that was just at my fingertips for me to be able to go out and and find that and i can then put that into the stuff that i'm making you know, has the accessibility of that information changed how people are recreating and making their own artwork, do you think? Or do you think that the artist is still independent of that access to information and it's not really changed a whole lot 
you know, I don't think the artist is independent of that information. Hmm. Um, what I think it's done is created a lot of artisans who are copying people's work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the internet's a wonderful thing. It really is. And the research you can do, and I always say you cannot do too much research. You know, you're looking for the journals of surveyors. People look up honey pouches. People look up knives. People look up all this stuff. And it's great, like I said, it's at the beginning of our conversation, if you're going to build on it and make it your own. But if you're going to take somebody's work and say, oh, I'm just going to do this just exactly like this, that's where it kind of falls down. Right. Yeah, but the internet's a wonderful thing. The amount of research you can't possibly get that much research in a in a library um, pre digital age. Yeah, I enjoy it too. I mean, obviously, a big part of of what I talk about is is the community involved in muzzleloading and in living history and and long rifle culture. That it's not just at the the annual shows that I can meet up and and talk with people. I can really see what everybody's doing and making year round and, and kind of get a taste of that all the time, which I think is really fun. <laughs> it is fun. Yeah, it is fun. It's nice to see, you know, on the internet, on other different social media, people post stuff and you think, Oh, that's neat that they did that. I really like that. And it's good to see them doing some neat work like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's enjoyable. It really is. So where do you see this community going in the next five to 10 years? And what do you hope to see? You know, if we have, if we sit down now in 10 years from today, you know, what, where do you think that the, the long rifle contemporary makers space, you know, what do you hope to see in that? It's, uh, it's not a real bright future in my opinion, because, you know, number one, you and I probably will not be able to sit down at another 10 years. I'll probably be long gone by then. No. But a lot of people in the long rifle, culture, long rifle culture are my age. And so we're aging out of it. And by aging out of it, I mean, we're passing on. Mm -hmm. You know, we need more younger people. And it's good to see things like the CLA with their scholarship program. And stuff that Paul Fennewalton was doing with the the inspired the, the new artisans work to get younger people involved. We need more younger people involved. And I'm not sure in the next ten years if we can get that many young people involved in this to keep it going like it is today. I believe it'll keep going. Um, but maybe not with the the large numbers. Mm -hmm. But I hope to see it keep going, and I hope to see the creative level get even higher than it is today. I hope uh, that, you know, in five or ten years, people are doing things that we can't even imagine today. Yeah. You know, and the, the way that the way that they've created that and the look that it's got. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to put it, that you know, we hope that there are people making stuff then that we can't comprehend right now because that means right. that they're they're growing and learning and, and transforming it into the next thing yes i really like that yeah yeah doing doing that they're doing that research they're studying other artisans and then they're building on that and that's 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 the neat stuff you know to, to see them do that yeah. you know there are a lot of young young inspiring artisans have come into the CLA in the last five years, and I look at some of them, and I've even even had workshops with with a few of them. But you look at them, and you see their work where it was five years ago and where it is today, and you think, "Wow, they have come a long way. They're mm -hmm. doing some neat stuff. They're doing research. They're talking to people. They're finding out what's out there, and they're building on it to make it their own." Well, and you know, not to butter you up, but I think you know people like you getting out there and, and sharing some of your processes that you've developed and, and being willing to kind of guide people through that really allows people to step, I guess, further into that and, and jump ahead almost, you know, you're, if somebody can take a class with you, they can, they can skip forward a little bit in time in their journey 
and and continue on that process even a little bit more. So, I mean, I, I thank you and anybody else out there who's who's sharing what they know to help keep the next generation going. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's uh, that's quite a compliment. I appreciate that. No, I, I mean it. I, I've known a lot of people that have, have passed on and it's – it's always sad to see them go, but when you know that they have given back and and they have passed, even just even if you just spend an afternoon with just one person, you can then see the person who's passed in that person. You know, every now and then you see that, and I think that's just a really yeah. special thing to to carry on. So I, yeah. I get <laughs> I get passionate about that. <laughs> From my perspective, it's a two edged sword. Hmm. Because, I you know I, I teach workshops. I put out the the, the, the two set DVD, soul yeah. patterns, all kinds of stuff. And what really disturbs me is the fact that I go into a show and I can tell you, I can walk down the aisles and tell you the guys that have watched my my DVD, <laughs> but they didn't take it to the next level. Right. That's, that's what I really like for people to do. That's one of the things that I expand on my workshop. You know, I'm giving you all this to build on, you know, yeah. don't just go copy my work and, you know, take it and make it your own. Yeah, but you know, so that it's a two-edged sword for that. You and you, we're going to find that in anything where people who enjoy just doing it to a certain level, and then you're going to find the artisans who want to take it even to the next level. Yeah, know? yeah, they're kind of the there are two. There's the the people that I guess just want to go out and drive the car, and then there's people that want to make it into a race car. And and go right. the go the extra mile. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, this would be better with a four barrel carburetor. Right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ken, to to kind of close out our time here, where can people find you and, and your work? You know, say somebody somehow doesn't know who you are or hasn't seen your work. Um, where can they go to learn more and, and to see kind of associate what we've been talking about with your work and, and your journey as an artist? Well, I've got a couple of websites, uh, Ken Scott pouches dot blogspot dot com. It's got a lot of my leather work on that. And then my paintings and the, and the uh, flat art is on uh, American Frontier Art dot blogspot dot com. And then if you want to see some stuff in person, you know, you can come to the CLA or Kalamazoo or one of those great shows like that and walk up to the table and and we can talk and you can ask questions, which is great. You mm -hmm. know, yeah, it's always great to have a conversation with somebody about my work and about what they're trying to do. I'd like to thank Ken again for coming onto the show and, and taking time out of his day to talk with me. Uh, it was really interesting to hear about how he looks at this artistic process and, and, and talk to him about going from, again, that uh, we talk about it a lot, but that original documentation and expanding on it and making it our own. I think when we look at muzzleloading history and we talk about it continuing through time and never really stopping, I think that's the kind of thing that we can look forward to in the future uh, of muzzleloading culture where we're honoring and respecting the past but we're not locked down to it we're able to to look back on it and and input our own experiences into it as we move forward through time and and honoring those traditions and and building new ones so i hope you've enjoyed this episode a little bit different uh than we than we've done in the past here we weren't necessarily talking about burning powder uh you know, running around in the woods wearing funny clothes, but it's, you know, the kind of thing that it's, it's fun for me to get these different perspectives. And I, and I hope it is for you too. Uh, I, I really enjoy Ken's work, like I said, and, um, and I hope you do as well. And, and I hope you enjoy getting this insight into Ken and, and how he works here. I'll have a link in the show notes and the description, as well as a blog post at ilovemuzzleloading.com with photos of Ken's work and links to his website and, uh, and his social media pages, where you can find out more and see more of Ken's work 
uh, and and see how his process goes pictorially. It's hard to describe really and get the full impact of it in audio form here. But I encourage you to check out some of the photos and the visuals that that Ken publishes and that we'll be linking here with the episode to, to really complete the ensemble of what Ken is talking about and, and get a greater understanding of it. As we head towards summer here, I'm planning to, to get out to a couple local shoots and events here. I'm going to be doing some traveling, uh, which I'm excited about to hopefully bring you some more insights into muzzleloading culture and, uh, and the muzzleloading event space as we've kind of moved on past the rough couple years. And uh, I think we're heading back into more of a normal space here in muzzleloading, which is really nice. There's a, a lot of great events going on. I encourage you to check out ilovemuzzleloading.com to, to see some of our muzzleloading event schedules that we have there. We're trying to post some of the flyers and information about muzzleloading events from around the country there. But I also want to take a quick side note here and tell you about reenactingschedule.org. It's not sponsor or anything, uh, but Frank Jarbo is making this website as a go-to resource for living history events around the United States, no matter your era. I think here in the U.S. it's going to be predominantly you know, French and Indian up through uh, really the mid to late 1800s. But this is going to be a catalog of events. It's free of charge to browse and look at, uh, free to plan some of your travel season. And I really encourage you to check it out. I think Frank is doing us a great resource here by making a one-stop shop to be able to find these events and plan travel to them. I've received a lot of questions over the past year about ways to support the show and, and the website. Um, based on just some of the demand I've had, I made a few I Love Muzzleloading hats like you see me wearing at an event or, uh, or in a video that you can check out at ilovemuzzleloading.com. Um, all the proceeds go to, to help keeping the website going and, and help me take some extra time out to, to record and, and travel to some of these events. No pressure. Uh, not really asking for a handout, uh, but I've just if you want a hat, if you've been asking for one, we do have a few of those on the site now. That is all I have for you today. I really appreciate you uh, listening. If you've listened this far in the show, thank you. We've had a nice spring, I think, here for the podcast, and I have quite a few more interviews lined up here as we head into summer. I hope you'll enjoy them. As always, if there's somebody out there that you'd like me to talk to on the show, please reach out and ask me. Uh, shoot me a message on any of the social media platforms.